If you'll open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Begin reading in verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. We're in our study on assurance, and we will close some things out today. Uh, next week, uh, Barry Sewell will begin a study looking at uh, culture from a biblical basis and uh, dealing with some things there. And he will have uh, teach for several weeks. I don't know how many weeks he's got planned, but we, we gave him some, some free reign there to put his study together. So uh, he'll be teaching for several weeks. We're looking forward to that. Uh, but before he begins next week, we want to close out some things on the doctrine of assurance. There may be some things later we come back and, and touch on again, but there are some things that we want to close out, and we'll do that this morning uh, by looking at some things in Romans 8 and continuing on. Let's begin reading in verse 9. Now remember, this is coming from Paul's whole, whole argument about um, the conflict of, of the two natures and wretched man that I am who will set me free from the body of this death and verse 1 of chapter 8 therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and he says in verse 9 however you are not in the flesh speaking of believers you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of, of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit, who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You alone are good and right. You alone are holy, pure, per perfect. There is no sin in You, no wrong in You. You are great and mighty and powerful. We bow before you. The one living, true God of all the ages. We bow this morning asking your mercy upon us as we think about this wonderful assurance of salvation and yet recognize there are many pitfalls for those who do not see salvation in proper biblical terms. Even through this study, may we see Christ for who He is rightly and understand these truths that we may have assurance in the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Spirit. 
Our faith is secure in your Son by the work of your Spirit, and all glory and honor be unto you. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, last week, we were ending with some of the ideas of faulty approaches of assurance of faith. Faulty approaches. And when we looked at some of those faulty approaches, we noticed that most of it came from the ideas of universalism or, or this, what was called by one writer, informal positivism. Uh, the fact that there are many people say, well, God is good, God is love, therefore everybody's going to be saved. It's, it's all okay. Uh, others will uh, look positively upon human nature and say, well, everyone's basically good, so eventually we'll all kind of get there and God will get us through it and we'll all be together because we're all God's children. And several weeks ago we noted that there is a difference between being uh, under God's authority in creation and being one of His adopted children, His heirs, through Christ alone. So we noted some positive things that we could see uh, the inference of cause in believing. Those who believe, repent and believe in the gospel properly understood, in Christ Jesus alone. All that Christ has done, we repent according to who we are and believe according to what Christ has done. And in all that Christ has done, we may be assured by the work of the Spirit in us that there is genuine faith. And this is what Paul is getting at here in Romans. Our assurance is not in ourselves. Our assurance is in these, uh, these purposed causes in Christ. That we repent of who we are as sinners and we believe in who the Lord Jesus is and what He has done and according to the Spirit's work in our lives. There are also evidences of these things that take place and we discuss those briefly as well. These evidences are the growth of the person in Christ. That our sin is not just left alone and we act as if sin is no problem. Even if we may be, the confession says, in dark sin for a while, the Spirit of God deals with us and brings us back to this place under real, genuine, true conviction. And upon being in true conviction, under true conviction of our sin, what happens? We're brought to repentance. It's always coming back to repentance and faith in Christ. Even for believers, we're brought back to repentance. And in that repentance, we will continue to fight sin. The, the desire to hate and fight against sin is an evidence. Paul wrote to the Corinthians to test themselves. We talked about Peter making your calling and your election sure. These things are understood in the context of seeing sin for what it is, hating it for what it is against God in rebellion, repenting of it, fighting against it, and continuing in repentance, conviction and repentance of sin. Good works comes out of the true believer. Good works does not save us, and we'll see some of that a little bit this morning, but good works is a result. And these are evidences. There's also what Paul is speaking of here, the witness of the Spirit. There are times in a believer's life where the, the Spirit of God gives witness to the truth of God in our souls. And one of the ways that the Spirit brings about this witness is in the desire to fight sin. Paul says in verse 9 of Romans 8, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Those who are in the Spirit hate the flesh, not just the physical body that, you know, 
I know we all have, you know, things we don't like about our physical bodies, but that's not what he's dealing with here. When he speaks of the flesh, he's talking about the remaining flesh, the remaining body of sin. The faculties of sin still remaining, hanging on. Sometimes they feel like great weights and anchors around us. But he says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. He goes on and says, well, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. This is what the Spirit is going to do. The Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, so the Spirit has raised you from the dead, and now you're going to fight against those things of remaining flesh and sin because you'll hate those things because the Spirit's witness will be in you. If we find ourselves in a place that we love our sin so much that we will not give it up, we should think we are in danger. Not in danger of losing our salvation, but we are in danger that we have never been saved to begin with. If we come to a place that we love our sins so much that we will not give it up, the danger is, is that we were never converted to begin with. For those who have the Spirit... We are now under an obligation, Paul says, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But our obligation for those who are in the Spirit is that you are putting to death the deeds of the body. And in that you will live. So the evidences and the witness of the Spirit work hand in hand. We must recognize that the Spirit's work in us is a true leading of the Spirit because we are the children of God. If you're adopted into God's family, you're His and He's not going to lose you. And if you're His and He's not going to lose you, you are also those who are going to hate sin. And you're going to want to fight against the deeds of the flesh. There are many of those who walk in these faulty approaches because they have not understood the gospel rightly. And so therefore they apply the gospel wrongly. There's fatal application because there is misunderstanding, there is poor teaching. And one writer says, a modern writer, says the lost world is not so much gospel hardened as it is gospel ignorant. The essential themes that make up its very core, the justice of God, the radical depravity of man, the blood atonement, the nature of true conversion, and the biblical basis of assurance are absent. He says the problem is that there's so much out there about Christianity, especially in America, but all over the world, but much of what is out there is very ignorant. And therefore, it causes people to be very ignorant about Christianity. Think about it. Under the name of Christ, people teach universalism. Now, some of those teaching universalism, they're not ignorant. They're just false teachers. But those who are hearing that may be ignorant of truth because they're not hearing the truth. This writer is saying there's very major essential themes that are forgotten or displaced or not even taught. And those things are like the justice of God, the radical depravity of man. 
we've said many times in our study on the doctrines of grace, if you'll teach biblical sin properly and rightly, a lot of the doctrine of salvation will fall right into place. Much of the problem with the church today is the church doesn't have a proper view of sin. Much of the problem in missions today is missionaries don't have a proper view of sin. Much of the problem throughout us quote-unquote reaching the world is that we think we're reaching the world when we've actually lost them because we're not teaching and preaching a biblical view of sin. If we got radical depravity right, a lot of other things would fall into place. This is why so many can find themselves in a place that they think they're saved because there's been fatal application of right doctrine. Or excuse me, fatal application of wrong doctrine. The right doctrine has not been preached. The right doctrine has not been taught. Even our confession on the chapter of assurance of grace and salvation tells us in paragraph 1, Although temporary believers and other unregenerate men may vainly deceive themselves, and how do they do it? With false hopes and carnal presumptions. We'll see a little bit about the application of that. Many Arminians and antinomians have false hope and carnal presumptions. In another place in our confession in paragraph 3, the confession states that we don't need extraordinary revelation to know that we are assured of faith. And yet there are groups that teach the importance of extraordinary revelation in being assured of your salvation. And one of those is the Roman Catholic Church. Some will say you can't have assurance because if you really have assurance, it leads to loose living. And the confession notes that at the end of paragraph 3. This is the teaching of legalism. Legalism will always want to do away with assurance either explicitly or implicitly because people will say, well, you can't be assured because if you're assured, you'll take grace beyond its means and you'll do things that you shouldn't do. This goes back to last week in talking about the Pharisees. What was the application of the Pharisees? The only way that they could end up knowing for sure that they thought they were the children of Abraham or a part of the kingdom of God in their understanding was in their own human merit. So one of the first fatal appliances or applications of uh, the doctrine of assurance is through the idea of human merit. We see it in the Pharisees. They were always looking at their own works. Remember, look at what I do. Well, sadly, the Roman Catholic Church has carried this on for centuries. They've even gone as far as to say at the Council of Trent in the mid-1500s, a believer's assurance of the pardon of his sins is a vain and ungodly confidence. If any saith otherwise, let him be anathema. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that an assurance of salvation is vain and ungodly. The scripture doesn't give us that indication. One of those that, uh, one of the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church that lived in the post-Reformation, not too long after the Council of Trent, he wrote, the principal heresy of Protestants is that saints may obtain to a certain assurance of their state before God. He calls assurance of faith a heresy.
Why is assurance of faith a heresy? Because to the Roman Catholic Church, human merit is how you base your salvation in the context of life. What do they say? Look at yourself. If you'll do this, pray this rosary. If you'll go here and you'll do this, then you're gaining your salvation. Would that not also be a good uh, object for them for selling indulgences also? It was certainly. Uh, somebody asked about the selling of indulgences and how that connects. Certainly that was a, an issue with the selling of indulgences. Because they wanted to say, you could apply this even to someone else's life. One writer says, Rome asserts that it is neither obligatory, nor possible, nor desirable that anyone should attain assurance without a special revelation. Rome was teaching that you needed an extraordinary special revelation of God to even know or have any type of assurance of faith. Directly connects to the idea of indulgences because what you would want to do is these indulgences would help you in some way. You could purchase this indulgence to help give you some piece of insurance, assurance in the moment. But what kind of living is that? And who's getting the gain? An extraordinary or special revelation would mean that you would have to have some kind of vision from God to know that you were assured. What does that mean? That takes you away from scriptural truth, doesn't it? That means that you can't take the truths that the scripture is teaching where Paul plainly says, here's the evidences. The Spirit of God witnessing with your spirit. And upon His witnessing with your spirit, you will hate sin, biblical sin, according to the truth of the Word of God. Whatever God defines as sin, and it is revealed to you in the very Word itself, the Spirit will take that revelation and deal with you, and you will want to come in compliance with the truth of God. And therefore, in that, the Spirit of God will witness you with your spirit that you can have assurance. Or you may have it. But the Roman church says, the Spirit of God can't work with the Word of God to give you assurance. The only way possible is that you have to have some extraordinary revelation. But that flies in the face of actual biblical teaching. And it takes people away from the Scripture. You can understand now why the Roman Catholic Church could go on reading the Scripture in Latin for centuries in the Mass, and probably over 90% of people had no idea what they were hearing because they didn't know Latin. They're keeping people in the dark to the very Word of God. And therefore, by keeping them in the dark to the very Word of God, they're keeping them in the dark to salvation, to the promises of God, to what it means to be an heir of His kingdom, to what it means to be adopted into His family. And so, therefore, they're keeping them away from what? Any assurance. Now, I hate to say it, but part of the reason to do that is, is to keep people under your thumb that you can lead them and direct them and get them to do what you want them to do. And the selling of indulgences was a part of that. Well, we see this issue of human merit uh, is prevalent even today. The Roman Catholic Church is still teaching it. There's lots of groups that still hold to it. And if you go and study most world religions, part of the great problem of those religions is they're looking at human merit. Even your Eastern religions are looking at human merit. How decent of a person? And they would say, how good of a person are you? Are you doing these good things? This makes you good before God. But once again, that goes away from the doctrine of radical depravity, doesn't it? 
How good are we before God? Are we this good? This good? Are we this good? How good are we according to Scripture? Not one is... Not one is... Not one is good. Not one is righteous. The idea of human merit in any religious teaching to give you assurance or to give you salvation itself is false teaching. And it leads to destruction. One of the other con concepts that causes great problem is the issue of, of human will. For many churches, teachers of our modern day, and really for the last few centuries, and in different portions of history as well, to some, sometimes the, the idea of the human will has been greater in some portions of history than others. But the human will is the basis of our assurance. They take John chapter 3 out of context. They say, well, because of our will, I have a free will, and I freely chose to believe. And so therefore, based on my human will, I have assurance because I believed. Well, now, thankfully, God can still work in the souls of people even though they have ignorant doctrine and he can enable us to believe rightly according to truth even though we have ignorant things in our head that were taught improperly to us yet this has caused great confusion for many people they live most of their life thinking in some way that their free will has added to the gospel even if it was 0.012% Paul is telling us here that this is all of Christ and all by the application of the Spirit. For in verse 15 he says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption. You've received it. How did you receive it? The very word there is not in the sense that one in and of themselves wandered around in the wilderness and somebody just said, oh, here, take this. And we went, oh, yes. The idea of the context of the whole of the passage is that God himself did something in the soul enabling us to receive that which was true. Dead sinners don't receive anything in and of themselves, do they? You ever tried to feed a dead person a meal? I know it sounds gross. I know that's probably not the best illustration, but think about it for a minute. It makes no sense, right? So spiritually, in the context of our souls, dead sinners are not going to have you just feed them. They have to be enlightened. To receive that food, they have to be, what? Enabled. Maybe a better illustration is when you're feeding a baby sometimes and you're feeding them a vegetable they don't like. And what do they do? They close their little lips really tight and they don't want you to put that spoon in there. Because if you get it in there, what are they going to do? Well, that's how sinners are with the truth of God. So what is this business about free will? If we understand the doctrine of depravity rightly, how can we say, by free will, I have believed? Yes, you did willingly believe once you had been changed. 
It was your will that, was, that believed. But your will had to be changed. If you really take this idea of free will to its logical conclusion, I think John Gerstner is right. He says, according to the Arminian view of free will, the individual cannot have assurance, even in heaven. If someone is so staunch on their view of free will, then you must keep that doctrine to its very end conclusion. And that means... You were born again by your own free will. You have been kept by your own free will. And you will have your free will in heaven. And what is it in you that when you see heaven will keep you there? Or could you even enter the very kingdom of God in holiness upon your own free will? I say no. Because we are sinners, we must be saved, changed, made new, regenerated by the very Spirit of God that enables us to believe. Human merit and human will are not places of assurance. It's Christ merit through God's will worked out through the Son's will by the Spirit's will, according to the Word of God, that gives us assurance. Even in this, in this camp of free will or human will, there's the idea of human presumption. Uh, many Antinomians use this. Now, we, we've talked about this word before. Uh, uh, I can't spell today. Well, not today. Anti. Nomian. Namas, law, anti law. Against the law. The idea of being against the law is working off of human presumption. What is that human presumption? It once again goes back to explaining God's grace wrongly. A lot of people say, well, you know what? God's a God of grace. He's not a God of law. And so therefore, what I have here is all of grace. And it is all of grace. Yet, it's grace rightly explained. If you're coming off of the idea of human will, and you say, well, in my free will, I can choose to be saved or reject being saved, and I do all of this in my own human will, what's really left of grace? What ends up happening is, is you spend most of your life presuming upon grace that which is not true of grace. Grace has been extended to you because of what you did. And that's not the definition of grace. There are some who, even in our own area here, there's been a free grace seminary that started several years ago. And it works off of the idea of antinomianism. And you know where it ends up? It's a no lordship salvation. They teach it. They teach that you can accept the salvation of God and not have Jesus as Lord. And that during your life you have opportunity to make Him Lord of your life. Well, now, what's that sound like? Who's really the Lord? Who's really the King? Man is. That's kind of the extent of hyper-Calvinism, too. And that's where 
wonder how Calvinism and Arminianism could come back together. Yep. It's one of my points here is human insight. The hyper-Calvinist assurance would rest upon insight into the decree. And so basically saying, well, what? God decreed this. I can know he decreed it. I have insight into that decree. And therefore, I can do what? Rest on my laurels. Well, the Calvinist says... The genuine, biblical-based Calvinist says, I know the decree is true, but I have no idea who are God's elect and who are not. I know the decree is true and real and actual, but I have no insight to it whatsoever. It's all by God's grace. Therefore, if God has saved me, and the Spirit is witnessing that truth in me, then I will be one who will desire to repent and be a continuing repenter of my sin. If I'm wanting to hold on to my sin and I love my sin more than I love that which is true of Christ and the gospel, if I love my sin more than I love obedience to God, then I'm in danger. But the hyper-Calvinist says, well, no, no, no. Because of the decree, I don't have to worry about all that. As if they really know what the decree is. The hyper-Calvinist is not only just about evangelism, it's about sanctification. It's the other side where the Arminian group sometimes go to, goes to the carnal Christian view. The hyper-Calvinist can go to the opposite side of that. And still have a carnal Christian view. So that human insight to God's decree is not something we have. We can't rest on that and say, well, God elected me, therefore. How do we know our election and our calling is sure? But by the Spirit of God witnessing with our spirit according to the truth of God's word keeping us as those who are repenting repenters, as the Puritans said. The Spirit of God will witness according to the Word of God in me, and I will hate my sin. And even if it becomes dark sin, at some point I will be brought to such true conviction. Not only will I want to get rid of it, but I will begin to fight it and put it to death. Maybe even, even in ways that I haven't before. Sadly, even some of our own brothers and sisters in the Reformed view have created a fatal application of assurance by human invention and that is infant baptism. Some groups hold the view that infant baptism actually does something, that it takes original sin away. That's the Roman Catholic view predominantly. Some will say, well, it brings them into the covenant community and therefore they're covenant children and therefore later we'll find out if they're covenant breakers. But you're giving those children a false assurance, even by calling them people in the covenant community. The only ones who are in the covenant community are the ones who have repented and believed, the ones that God has done a work in them. You cannot be in the covenant community by infant baptism or any baptism. Baptism does not save. There are some people in churches today, and sadly even in Baptist churches, that they got baptized when they were really, really young, three or four, some even earlier in infant baptism, 
and they think they're converted all because of this human invention. In a Baptist church some years ago, witnessed a four-year-old getting baptized. The pastor asked her why she wanted to be baptized, and her answer was, I love Jesus. It's not necessarily a terrible answer. My only question is, has she ever really understood her sin to know why she needs to love Jesus? Probably not. I don't know the little girl's soul. Leave that in the Lord's hands. But too many churches, even Baptist churches, have created a human invention that brings about false assurance or false or fatal application. It brings us back to our universalist idealists and the issue of human hope. At the end of the day, they look upon Christ and the work of God as simply hope in humanity. Jesus is just another religious figure to help us get through this world. But basically, our hope is in humanity. If we'll all just be better people, we'll all be okay. And that's a fatal application of assurance even to use the Lord Jesus in that. Because the Lord Jesus is not just a decent, good, religious man. The Lord Jesus is the very Son of God. Human hope is a fatal application of assurance. All our hope must be in Christ alone. Why? Because we are pervasively depraved Sinners before a holy God. And Christ is His one and only Son who is perfect from eternity past, present, and future. Of the same essence of God the Father and God the Spirit. And yet He came upon this earth and He walked, born of the Virgin Mary. And He lived a perfect life where no other human has. He lived perfectly before God. He lived God's law perfectly before God. Each and every day, even in thought, He lived it rightly. All assurance is in what the Hebrew writer calls the anchor of our soul, the Lord Jesus Christ. If your assurance is in anything else, Human invention, human merit, human will. If it's in any of those things, it's a false assurance. All assurance is in Christ alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've been merciful that we could spend some time thinking through the truth of assurance of salvation. Lord, I pray those things which are truthful and helpful that were spoken this morning that may be applied by the work of your Spirit to your glory alone. May it be so. That which was not helpful, may it be stricken from the record of the minds of the hearers. That you would be glorified in the truth of your word and not in the teacher or preacher. All glory be unto you through your Son, the Lord Jesus, by the very witness of your Spirit upon our own spirits. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.